materials. So obviously recently I've released a new lighting product for Blender called Afterglow. This is one of my big interests, you know, emissive lighting in Blender. But another interest of mine going back years through lots of different tutorials I've done on this channel is slash R procedural materials. And by extension, a category of materials that I call semi procedural materials. Now a while ago I teased something and I might have said it was on its way and then it just kind of dropped off the map. I showed you like a very realistic clay material I had made that was done in a bit of a different way to how other people have been making realistic clay materials in the CG space. It was what I called a semi-procedural material, where it employed every technique we've used so far for procedural materials, combining it with like generated noise masks, scattering it around with Voronoi scattering, so Voronoi cells, where you project the image content inside of those cells through some complicated vector math, and then blend them together to make it look like an infinitely repeating material or texture. Now I'm not too like into the vector math side of things, so I made a Voronoi scattering node inspired by the work of Jonathan Lampel, I believe that's who did an educational piece about it as part of their scattershot product, but there are lots of different methods for scattering textures around objects to make them look infinite. And a lot of them have very simple or traditional use cases like how do you make grass in a terrain look like it's not a tiling material. But what I wanted to use scattering techniques for were some more esoteric, but also I think cooler use cases. So first of all, I hate the idea of making seamless textures. The process of doing that sounds really boring. It's quite easy to do now, I can do it in Substance Sampler with just like one drag of an effect, but that's beside the point. I wanted to know if we could create like a very smart scattering setup that makes it pretty much impossible to tell where tiles started and ended. I wanted to maximize the surface area, so to do that we needed to use very specific types of geometries, so Voronoi cells alone aren't always the best for that. I wanted to do it where I could take samples of anything in real life. Life. So in the past I very quickly made some clay lumps and then just attacked them pretty much with different types of tools and even my hands, my fingers just to change the layout, took pictures of them and then quickly generated different masks, so like height, normal, etc. with sampler anyway, which I wanted to be optional. And I was impressed with how far I could go with the early versions of this technique when making that realistic clay, without making the original images seamless just by being careful with the lighting. The results were very good, but I didn't feel like I could release that to the world because something about the scattering felt wrong. There are a couple of hiccups, so one of them was random rotation. With the way I was doing it before, randomly rotating the content of a texture inside of those cells wasn't compatible with the mapping that was being given to the image textures. So you'd have to create your own type of mapping, which is relatively easy to do, right? You just use triplanar mapping or a variation of that, and then pass that through to the texture as the vector input. But that alone isn't good enough if you want to make something really convincing. So in the end I stepped away from releasing that because it just, it felt incomplete, not completely functional. And and it felt like to make it look right you had to have the scattering values in a very precise layout, very precise values for it to look convincing. Now this was a while ago and I remember mentioning it to a few friends of mine and one of them said something interesting. A friend of mine, Chris, in a voice call said that they had been rattling an idea around in their mind for a little while for a hexagonal tile type of scattering and they had different ideas for blending the tiles together. We kind of left it at that for a while, got on with doing different things in lives, but then after I released Afterglow, recently, I had a little bit of disposable income, most of the money from the release went to paying for some medical fees, literally less than 24 hours ago I had a gastroscopy with biopsies, I've joined the hiatus hernia club, yay, and then a little bit left over and what I did with that is I gave that to my friend. So I actually offered it to two friends. I asked the first one if they wanted to have a go at making a better scattering setup for me, and they had a really good go at it, but again when we got to this random rotation part it became a really difficult challenge. So for a series of different conversations I let the second friend have a go, which was the friend that said they had an idea for this scattering earlier on, and over the course of I don't know how long it was, maybe a week, two weeks, something like that, they managed to produce something so cool, it pretty much just solves every issue I had with scattering, it's opened up like a whole new tech tree of procedural material design for me, and I'm gonna show you a little bit about this. It will likely make its way into future products, it's not something I'm gonna do a breakdown showing you how to make from scratch, because to be honest I don't actually understand it. This is why I had to recruit the help of Chris in this project, because Chris does understand this stuff. Now I have actually, I've made my own version of the node tools after the fact, so though I don't understand how all of the nodes work, 
work, I have managed to reverse engineer it for a different purpose. We're going to talk a bit about this because that's going to sound very confusing to start with. All you really need to know is that I am now sitting on one of the most powerful procedural material tools that I think exists in the community. So the philosophy behind this one is kind of as follows. Instead of Voronoi scattering, we're going for hexagonal scattering, with the reason being that hexagons are bestagons. Hexagons are great for maximizing the surface area while minimizing the material between, and that's kind of like a physical fact. Things in reality emergently form into hexagonal shapes, like honeycombs. Bees don't actually make hexagons, they kind of make more circular shapes, and then the forces kind of just settle them into hexagons as they dry. It's also why you get like the um, like Giant's Causeway in Ireland. Hexagons are very structurally sound while maximizing surface area. So we thought that this would be great for like doing texture scattering. So you can really get a lot of texture content sitting next to each other in a tessellating pattern. But to make that work, you just have to find a way to blend the edges of the towels in a more interesting way. The way people typically do this is just by kind of overlaying generated noise textures or some kind of white noise to try and like dither things. So basically it's just a lot of creative smudging if you want to think about it that way. Now that's how I typically would have done stuff because I don't have a more advanced understanding of the math side of things. But Chris was like, nah, we've got to do it properly. So what they proposed was instead of just focusing on scattering any type of texture data exactly the same, like you would scatter a color map the same as you would scatter like a normal map or something like that. They proposed we would give some extra attention to height. I, this never would have crossed my mind if Chris hadn't proposed it. But what it means is that by using the height data, you can guide a more complex blending between cells. And the results are outstanding. <laughs> now this technique is not necessarily new. I've seen variations of this for like game development with terrain blending, right? And that's actually something that I think quite a lot of people will be familiar with. There are lots of complex types of ways you can blend between like parallax materials or just displacement materials that have multiple maps by recycling different data in those maps to guide the process. But the thing is, we haven't really seen a lot of this in Blender. I think because the use cases have been quite different. Like there are lots of different types of terrain shaders for Blender. But I think for something like this, it's like taking those high level techniques and then condensing them down into a more refined use case. So for me, I'm not interested in making large scale terrains, although this would probably be still applicable for that. I want to focus in and make really high quality procedure materials. So high quality materials that can be applied to any object, any sculpt, any product, anything you like. So I'm in Blender here and I've just got a bit of a demonstration object in front of us. What we're seeing here is a texture sample, just one sample actually at the moment, of me using my thumb and fingers to press clay when I was making these early physical samples for my realistic clay. But recycling that here is a demonstration texture. There are only really three images being used here. The color of the image I took, a generated height version made in Substance Sampler, and a generated normal version. They're relatively small images, they're not seamless. So the idea is for a creative use of blending, we will turn this one physical sample that I've taken pictures of and turn it into an infinite material. And that is what we're seeing here. Now it's a bit slow because I've got adaptive subdivision on at the moment, so I'm letting it generate geometry out of the uh, surface of the sphere, or rather a subdivided cube in this case. But you can see the information of my fingerprints here being used to try and displace the surface. And you can see where the polygons are, but we can hide those by increasing the quality. So what I'll do just to demonstrate what this new node can do is just unplug some of these values. And we're going to take the uh, just the height information. And I'm going to set every value I have here to zero and turn off adaptive subdivision just to speed things up a bit. So what we have here is a starting point for this material. And you can see what it's attempting to do is project the texture content inside of hexagonal tiles. Now obviously, because this is using a triplanar projection to wrap the result around an object, it's not going to be perfectly hexagonal everywhere. In fact, there's another demonstration object I can show you here, like uh, an art frame. And this kind of shows it a bit better here. You can see we've got our main hexagon, which is then tessellated with other ones around it. Actually, this object might be a better demo to use. So this is where we start. It's kind of interesting scattering things on hexagons as it is. But then the question is, how do we blend between them? Them. Well, we're already previewing the height data, which means that if I do any blending between the height, this would be a good way to see it. So Chris gave me some lovely parameters. They really spent a lot of time on this. I'm so impressed with it. Under cell blending, we can see that there's a height blending value. And if I scrub that up, that actually happened way too quickly. I mean, the, the seams are already gone. So let me do that a bit slower so you can actually see what's happening a bit more. Okay, so as I scrub this up, you can start to see that the borders bend and blur. What's kind of happening here is that the heights are almost kind of averaging out in a way. It might be interesting to see this as an example. So you're going to notice part of the other tile kind of creep in around this valley of height. So let me reduce that. And again, start blending. 
and you'll see it's almost filling out the valley almost as if like water or a mudslide is kind of coming in and filling in the space that's where the power of blending in this tool comes from now that alone is an impressive method but it's not always all you need because despite having that the triplanar projection on an object like this might still make a certain amount of the seams visible and you'll notice that if i increase the height blending though inside of these triplanar seams things are blending even better there's still this kind of line here chris also took this into consideration and then gave me a parameter to blend the triplanar seams as well using the same kind of method which means that if we're talking about procedural projection around objects we now have something that is quite feature complete it compensates for those issues this is something that i didn't have access to before at least not in my node so now let's improve this let's actually remove the height and plug in the color map so we have just the color here now chris also had the intuition to look at how when we are blending materials using height sometimes the colors combining will have quite a harsh fall off or in the way that there's not really any fall off as you can see we have like these harsh lines so to compensate for this there is color smoothing so if we scrub this up you see that the colors now blend between our new blending modes and if there are any areas where this is caused by the triplanar blending then there's color smoothing for that as well as you can see there so pretty much anywhere along this process where we find an issue we have a kind of correction for it interestingly as well they also managed to do this for normal data i wonder if i can show you this by plugging the normal in so obviously with normal maps when you're scattering them around if you're changing the rotation of the normal maps then you're changing the direction of all the normal information chris took this into consideration and added some nodes for normal correction which means that as we're doing like random rotations on all the image samples the directions are going to stay the same so each of the samples is going to correct its lighting effectively for the normal data so if i combine this together by putting the color in there plugging the height into displacement so we get some new geometry and then plugging the normal into the normal input so we can see a bit more kind of height info there from the normal then we start building up a believable surface which we can modify the values of on the fly let me increase some random rotation here just to give us a bit of variety and some random scale between the cells so we now have an expertly blended pretty much infinite procedural material just from one image taken from a real life sample but then split into three different maps and if i take some ambient occlusion here as well and plug that in then it's going to darken some of the new geometric areas so i can scrub that back and forth and you can start to see how we take this and then we can combine it with other layers to create even more compounding more complex materials so for example i've got another node group here that's kind of been pre-established for a more scalpel like effect so if i plug these values in so what we're seeing here is an example of where I've taken like a knife and I've cut into clay and kind of pushed it to the side in a bit of a wavy motion. So we're seeing this now represented again as like an infinite semi-procedural material with this new blending mode. I just realized I didn't actually take adaptive subdivision back on, so that should be a bit better now. Give us a bit more detail. Now if I take this one and combine it with AO, let's see what that does. There we go. So we can really accentuate those uh, scalpel grooves there. What it means is that we can also start layering up these node groups. So I'm going to go back into this like a picture frame mode this is a really good way to kind of see the height data there coming out of the frame i really like this because as it is it already kind of looks like a piece of art oh and if you're wondering about the lighting by the way do you already know where this is going i'm using a studio cage 9 from my afterglow product it's a pack of incredible lighting assets we've got studio environments studio cages it's all based on emissive lighting which gives you more kind of physical presence and flexibility in describing the light with nodes definitely recommend checking it out so now we've got this physical demo of the material we can try doing a little bit of blending so let's say i take a mix color node and I plug in the height of our fingerprint with the height of our scalpel now obviously we've got the other maps already plugged in so I can remove those if I want to and then I'm going to plug the result of our mixed height into the displacement height now it's going to be a bit tricky to see because we're just looking at height so let me put that at an angle now if I go all to zero we just have the fingerprint type height one and then if I go the other way then we have the scalpel and if I go to something like overlay you can start to see how we have like these larger lines here these larger curves and as I blend the factor upwards then it's kind of adding in some height data from the other map so maybe we could do something similar with the color as well so let me plug in the fingerprint and the scalpel plug that straight into the base color so at zero we have just fingerprints and then at one we have just the scalpel marks if we do overlay then we get a kind of combination where the scalpel comes over the top so you can start to see that if we reapply traditional mask blending techniques then we can take different layers of scattering and combine them together and then still adjust their properties individually so if I increase the quality of what we're working with here 
So just to increase the quality of the geometry here so we can see a bit more of what's going on. If I now add a bit more random rotation to our fingerprint mask, then we can see how it's all correctively adapting. So let's take a look here where we can see like the grooves of the fingerprint and how they rotate around and the height of them blends with it as well. So that's kind of what we're working with here. This is like an, an R&D, a research and development project, just trying to catch up with more advanced scattering techniques, what we previously had available. So I'm effectively abandoning Voronoi scattering at this point in time just to experiment and come up with new types of materials using this method. There are so many possibilities, you don't have to use every map like I've shown you, like the height or even the normal. There's support for pretty much like a full PPR workflow here with metallic and roughness as well. But if you wanted, you could totally just use one image. And I have some ideas for that as well, but I just thought it'd be interesting to kind of show you something we've been working on behind the scenes for some future material products. So let me go to more of a thing I prepared earlier. What we have at the moment is a couple of optional methods for scattering. So we've got one with which focuses on triplanar mapping for wrapping around an object. But triplanar requires quite a few iterations of the image samples, which makes things a bit slower. Chris had an intuition for how to potentially get around this performance drain, which is used a method called biplanar mapping, which uses fewer iterations of the images at the cost of maybe making some areas of the projection look a bit pinched on an object. Now to start with, given how Chris had designed the nodes, and honestly inside the nodes it was so well packaged and well presented, but it, it didn't really allow for multiple different materials inside of one file because all the images were contained inside of a node group to make them accessible and that node group was then well integrated into all different layers of the math. What I did was I basically destroyed it <laughs> by ripping it all apart and then doing what I've called a preamble version of the scattering where I split up all of the math that happens beforehand and called that the preamble. Then I've got all of the different iterations of the images and then I've got everything which happens afterwards which I'm calling the postamble. So preamble, postamble. And what that looks like is if we look in here for like the fingerprints, is this. So it's quite messy, but this is every iteration of every image required to calculate the fingerprint effect. And then what we do is we just duplicate this as a node group and then do the same thing for every other sample like scalpel and so on, so that they can be layered together. And you'd think from looking at all those nodes that the performance would be gut-wrenching and terrible, but it's still, as you can see, modifiable. And this is the more cost-intensive version, the triplanar mapping. I haven't actually done the preamble for the biplanar mapping yet, which is gonna be a lot faster. So anyway, what I've got now is a powerful starting point for now re-exploring the idea of doing realistic sampling of things in real life and then bringing that into Blender. So for example, like I said in previous videos back when exploring this at an earlier time, is that I've got samples of things like artifacts from history, like human history or natural history, and it would be nice to do image sampling from those, which lend a kind of authenticity to the materials rather than just making materials procedurally that look realistic, but aren't actually based on anything real. It's also something that AI artwork can't really generate and what I mean by that is that if you put value in authenticity and I provide you with a pack of materials that are taken from actual artifacts in history, what you'll get from that is a genuine guarantee of authentic sampling rather than an imitation that's imagined based on what other people have posted. But I'm not going to go entirely for realism. If I do make products with this in the future, I'm going to do some things which are more creative, strange and more abstract. As we've seen through previous experiments of me taking scans of my physical artwork in real life, bringing them into Blender, and then using those to scatter around and create interesting visual dynamics, combining those with more realistic procedural metal looking effects to get some interesting material combos. So yeah, stick around if you're interested in seeing where this goes. Again, if you want to support my work, Afterglow has just been released, or you can sign up on Patreon or sign up as a YouTube member. You get an icon by your name and access to some exclusive videos as well. Otherwise, feel free to subscribe, like the video, and have a great day. Oh, and I almost forgot. How could I forget? Please leave an emoji in the comments if you made it to the end. Remember, our default emoji now is the unicorn emoji, so that will be instantly recognizable for me. But otherwise, just put any emoji you like, maybe representing something you enjoy. I kind of rushed the end of the video a little bit because I started getting a bit of pain that I think was from my procedure. So I'm going to get back to work and I will see you next time.